finish off the last few slides of uh, last lecture, and then we can move on to today's lecture. So last time we looked at the V scan in the Jupyter notebook, um, and we had the non-convex cluster shapes so of two pieces of a circle that were sort of entangled. Um, and so we, we'll just go into that in a little bit more detail. First are the hyperparameters of the algorithm. So with k means the main hyperparameter is k. And here with the n, there are two hyperparameters. One is epsilon, which is the distance we use between points to decide if two points are a neighbor. So if I'm within that distance, then I'm a neighbor. So, for example, if this is epsilon, then the point highlighted in the box has all of these neighbors. The other hyperparameter is the minimum number of neighbors you need to be considered what's called a core point. And remember, this is called density-based clustering. So what we're really doing is looking for regions of a certain density of points. Um, and we're going to, if, if we see that, we're going to form clusters. So for example, this particular point in the blue box has six neighbors. If the minimum number of neighbors you need to become a core point is three, then this one becomes a core point. So we looked at some stuff like this uh, in the Jupyter notebook. But here's an illustration of, for a particular choice of the hyperparameters, we have a bunch of core points. Um, and each core point is sort of the seed of a cluster, and you join them together, um, forming bigger and bigger clusters. And you could end up with something like this for a particular choice of the hyperparameters. The stuff on the left looks sort of like what we had in the notebook last time. The stuff on the right is kind of interesting in that we have one cluster sort of wrapped around another cluster, which we wouldn't have for k-means. OK, so the, the clusters are made up of these core points plus boundary points which aren't themselves core, but can still be reached from some core point in the cluster. And the way the algorithm works, as I mentioned, is you just keep joining more and more points of the clusters, and then you have this group of core and boundary points. OK, so the pseudocode is for each example or point xi. If it's already in a cluster, that's fine. Um, first, you want to see whether you're a core point, which means see how many neighbors you have. Is that greater or not, or not than the threshold? And if you are a core point, you're going to expand the cluster from that point. What does that mean? Um, it means everything within epsilon of that point becomes part of the cluster, and then you iteratively apply this. So you're kind of growing outward, adding more and more nearby points. If a nearby point is core, you keep adding from there. If it's nearby but not core, meaning there's not enough density around it, you add it, but then you just stop there. So. What are the implications of all of this? One is that some points are not assigned to a cluster. So if you're in a very not dense region, then you just might not be a core point yourself or close to any other core point. And this could be good or bad. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. With k means, every point is always assigned to a cluster by looking at the closest me to that point. Um, there's a slight ambiguity in the sense that the boundary point will get added to, if you have two clusters and a boundary between them, whichever cluster tries to grab it first is going to get that boundary point as part of that cluster. Um, whereas if you started from the other side, then 
that uh, point. So I, I added some stuff over the weekend to the Jupyter Notebook demo attached to this lecture. In other words, the lecture from Friday. So you can take a look at that. Um, and I added an example of this where I change the order of the points in my data set, which generally we hope doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you see a boundary point being assigned to a different cluster. So with k-means, we had this pretty big nuisance about initialization that we were starting with some randomly chosen means. And depending on that choice, we could get very different results. So here, things are not so bad except for those boundary points. So you're starting somewhere. You essentially have an ordering of your points here, uh, which is sort of like the initialization. You're examining them one by one. But it's not, you can't get such drastically different results as we saw with k-means. But you can definitely get drastically different results by changing these hyperparameters. So we saw that a little bit. Uh, last time, but if epsilon is huge versus epsilon is small, you might go from having um, one big cluster to tens of little clusters or no clusters. And uh, but those two hyperparameters together sort of define the density that would be considered a cluster. Okay. Uh, another thing with k-means is that when we added a new point, we just computed its distance between all the means, um, whereas with, with here we have to think about the distance between this point and all the points, which is potentially much more expensive. <coughs> okay, Fed. Is it all of n squared, db scan? Is it O of n squared db scan? Yeah, someone asked about this on Piazza. Um, I could try to think about it for a minute. So that, I think naively it should be in the sense that you're going through each point and then <coughs> getting the distance from it to all the other points to check which distances are below epsilon. There are clever ways of making it faster, and I believe there's some stuff about that in the bonus slides. Don't know your name. Uh, Amit. Amit? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you've got a space that there's an obvious transformation to something that would work well with k-means, like with concentric circles, is it common to like map your space to something where you can have convex sets and just do k-means, or I don't know? So uh, the, the question is, if you have a situation where there's an obvious mapping to something that would work well with k-means, would you do that? So you mentioned concentric circles. Would your mapping be to separate them in another dimension, or what? Well, like, um, I forget the exact mapping, but you can like map like circles to like lines that are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Fed asked about this, I believe. Someone asked about it last time. Um, can we average a bunch of clusterings? Um, I, I guess this is a Piazza question from a couple of years ago. But um, the question is, with k-means, we got such different initializations, and we were talking about getting the best one. Well, why don't we just average them or get a whole bunch of different clusterings and average them? Because I spent last week trying to convince you that ensembling was a good idea, so can we do it here? Um, and so, yes, uh, we can average different clusterings, and we can use bootstrapping to get different clusterings and think about how sensitive our clustering is to the data set. But there's a problem which I was alluding to last class, which was this issue of label switching. So the, the picture here is showing an average of a bunch of, of runs of k-means. Um, and the result doesn't look good on this toy data set. And it's this issue we talked about that if I'm averaging, if I'm saying this, this clustering said that this point is in the red cluster and 
this cluster <coughs> says in the blue cluster, and the other one says blue, then I should vote blue. That doesn't make any sense here because, like we talked about, the labels are totally meaningless. So there is no sense in running a bunch of clustering algorithms and then for each point voting on the label because the labels are completely arbitrary every time. And a way around this um, is to, instead of averaging or considering the question, is this point in the red cluster, we can think of the question, for this pair of points, are they in the same cluster? And the answer to that question is invariant to the label switching in the sense that it doesn't matter if the cluster is called red or blue or one or seven, we can just check are they in the same or not. Um, and we could vote on, on quantities like this or questions like this and try to combine clustering. Um, and so there's more, more on this in the bonus slides as well. So this is now the summary slide for our Friday's lecture, which is we did introduce unsupervised learning, we did introduce clustering, we talked about k-means, seems like so long ago, um, and we talked about density-based clustering, we compared them a little bit, uh, we played around with some 2D examples in the Jupyter Notebook, and then just now we talked about something that can go wrong if you try to just naively ensemble clusterings and sort of the seed of an idea of how you might get around that without going into it too much. So that's it for the part of Friday's lecture that I didn't finish. Um, so I'm going to move on now to today's lecture. Okay. It's, Always a bit strange when I do these last time slides having been behind schedule. But last time we <coughs> talked about density based clustering. Um, so, this is a non parametric clustering method. <coughs> k means is parametric. The parameters are the k means. How many parameters are there? k times d. There was some discussion on Piazza about this. So, I have k of them, each one is a point in d-dimensional space, and those are the parameters we're trying to learn. You could kind of say, well, the labels, that was calling them z uh, in the notebook, are those also parameters? <coughs> I'd say not really. Um, they are also things that we need to specify while we're training or learning the algorithm, but they're in a sense totally determined by w and trivial to get. Once we have w, we can just assign each point to the closest mean. So from my perspective, I'd say the parameters of k-means are just the k-means. With, with db scan, on the other hand, we don't even have a notion of some kind of center point or representative point for each cluster. We're just taking points and <coughs> merging them with nearby stuff until there's nothing really nearby, and then we're stopping. Okay, so we talked about this, showing some non-convex clusters, showing some points that aren't assigned to any clusters. Um, if we have time later today, which pretty much never happens, we can go back to that notebook that I mentioned and those extra examples that I added. Okay, here we go. So. <coughs> this is a type of situation that can cause trouble for DB scan. Um, I have two clusters and I have different densities. I have the dense ones on the right and the more sparse ones on the left. But these hyperparameters just need to be specified and whatever I pick them to be, there is some density that it's looking for. <coughs> And depending on the values I pick, um, I may think the points on the left are not even part of any cluster, or I may think the points on the right are all one cluster. So here is a case with uh, it's looking for a higher density, so smaller epsilon. Um, 
and now here's a case with a bigger epsilon. And the key is, in the picture, these, the distance between those two clusters on the right, that's pretty much the same distance as the typical distance on the left. So as soon as I make epsilon big enough that things on the left are considered neighbors, the two entire clusters on the right are also considered neighbors. And this is one failure mode of density-based clustering that we're going to try to address today. Uh, any questions about this motivating example? If you have enough data, would it really be an issue? Or like, I feel like if you got enough data, then that would be more dense on the left. <clears throat> if we had enough data, would this really be an issue? Um, that would be, if we had enough data, then the thing on the left should be more dense. That might often be true, but it's not always true. Um, th yeah, th I, I see what you're saying. I mean, it may, it may also happen that as you add more data, you end up with more and more bridging points between those two clusters, which also makes them more likely to merge. Um, so I see your point, but I don't think it's always true that it's going to solve the problem. <coughs> OK. Um, so here is a possibly worse situation, um, which is that we sort of have levels of clustering, which is what we're getting at today with hierarchical clustering, which is that we sort of have clusters inside of other clusters. And someone also asked about that last time. I don't remember who it was. Someone who was sitting over there. Um, but here we are <coughs> in this situation. So what we want to do is have the output of our algorithm change. So between k-means and db-scan, the output wasn't that different. The only difference in the output was that db-scan allowed some points to not be al uh, allocated to any cluster. And with k-means, we got these means that we didn't get with db-scan. Um, but roughly speaking, we were assigning points to clusters. But here we're saying, let's change the goal. Let's change the output to be a hierarchy of clusters to actually allow a structured output that this cluster can be inside of this other cluster. And we can use DB scan or, or density based clustering to give us this sort of hierarchical situation. Um, and the way we can do that is to change epsilon and keep rewriting the algorithm with different values of epsilon and try to see what happens. So for example, we have epsilon being relatively small, then we get these clusters. So we record them and say, this is the bottom level, those are the two clusters. Then we can increase epsilon more and just rerun it. Everything exactly the same, but with a different hyperparameter. And we get these green clusters. And we know those blue ones are inside of the green ones, so we can start drawing this tree. Um, and we can even increase epsilon further and just keep doing this until we got one giant cluster. And now this tree here represents more information than what we are getting out of our clustering algorithms before. Yeah. Is the number of layers you decide to go with a hyperparameter? Is the number of layers a hyperparameter? So in this case, it isn't. We didn't know in advance how many layers we were going to get. And it depended on our schedule of changing epsilon. So um, it, it, we may have decided for some reason that we were just going to jump from epsilon equals 1 to epsilon equals 3 and then we would have only gotten two layers, and maybe then a different data set, we change epsilon more gradually, we got 10. Uh, so no, the, the depth of the tree is not a hyperparameter in the sense that you would specify it in advance. And how do you decide how to choose your epsilon? How do you decide how to choose your epsilon? Okay, let's uh, discuss one way of doing that. <coughs> 
So, um, the algorithm I'm about to describe is called agglomerative clustering. Um, and the way it works is that you start off with each point as its own cluster. And then you look for the closest clusters, and we'll need some way of saying how close is one cluster to another. So far it's not hard because each cluster is just a point, and we look at the distances between the points. Um, and then we merge them, and then we merge the next closest clusters. I guess the tree is upside down here, but that should be okay. Um, And so this is sort of the most fine-grained version, and is maybe one way of answering your question, Ian, which is, I'll just do the minimum change each time. I'll just merge two clusters. Um, and then when I'm done, I get this big tree, or maybe upside-down tree, um, showing the process. So this um, agglomerative clustering approach that I just mentioned is one of those things that has come up many times in different fields and has different names. Um, and one thing we need to do for it to work is specify what does it mean to compute the distance between two clusters. And there's many ways you could do this, and there's more on this in the bonus slides, but one way you could measure the distance between two clusters is for each cluster, take its mean, and then define the distance between two clusters as the distance between those means. You could do other things like the closest distance, um, or all sorts of things. So um, there's, there's also a bunch in the bonus slides on applications in this, but for example in biology you can think about evolutionary trees in this way by comparing different organisms and trying to cluster them, say, genetically, um, or all, all sorts of, of taxonomies of, of uh, different phenomena may break themselves down into, well, I have this type of customer and that type of customer, and within this type, I have this subtype and that subtype, etc. Okay. So that is what I wanted to say about hierarchical clustering. And then, the other thing I want to talk about today is outlier detection. So, um, motivating, as a motivating example, or bad example perhaps, um, and I didn't know about this before I took <coughs> this course, but apparently um, there was a big hole in the ozone layer that was discovered and it turned out it was actually known many years before that, but it was flagged and removed by some sort of quality control algorithm or outlier detection algorithm and just sort of ignored. So this is kind of a cautionary introduction and in general with outlier detection, there's sort of, there's many ways, reasons why you might want to be doing it, I guess I should say. So, uh, the word quality control kind of invokes the idea of I want to throw away the bad quality stuff. And it's true, sometimes there's bad quality data and if you don't get rid of it, it can really mess up whatever you're doing. Um, but there's this danger that weird stuff happens sometimes, right? And if you're just filtering it out, then that could be dangerous. The third element is Often people do outlier detection not because they want to clean the data set and have a version without the outliers, but because they're looking for outliers. So, for example, in the financial industry, this is super common, um, say in banking. So, I don't know who all has gotten a call from 
Visa or MasterCard or the bank saying, hey, there's this strange transaction, was it you, right? That is sort of this. Uh, it would probably be called anomaly detection rather than outlier detection, but they're trying to flag things that are unusual to follow up on those, uh, as opposed to just to remove them. Okay, I think we talked about most of this. Um, so, in terms of sources of outliers, sure, there's a lot of reasons why you might have an outlier, there might be an issue with your equipment, there might be a bug in your code that is recording telemetry data or, or whatever. Um, as I mentioned, there may actually be unusual stuff that's happening that's not a bug. So there's all sorts of reasons why this situation might arise, um, both real and mistakes. Okay, we talked about some of this. Um, so I guess I don't need to, to read off the slide for you. Um, but finance, for example, is an interesting application, and there's definitely a lot of work going on in that space. Um, there's also a lot of different approaches to outlier detection. So there's not one way of just going about this, and. Um, in particular, since we've talked about supervised and unsupervised learning in the course, you could imagine both being possible. Maybe I just have a whole bunch of transactions, and I just from having the features, right, that means unsupervised learning, it's already not crazy to say I'm going to try to figure out which ones are different. Maybe I'll cluster them, and things are not going to belong to a cluster, or I'll try to visualize them in some way, or compute some properties of them. Um, so in terms of, we've just been talking about unsupervised learning, this lecture is sort of falling in the unsupervised learning section of the course, but this could also be a supervised learning problem. It may be that, say, the bank already has tons of transactions and they've already investigated a bunch of fraudulent transactions, so they have a huge database of fraudulent and non-fraudulent transactions, and then it sort of feels like in maybe the spam filtering situation where I have a binary classification problem and a huge data set. So you could approach this from both perspectives, and I guess more generally, there is sort of a blurring of the line between supervised and supervised learning, and we will talk about that later in the course when we talk about recommender systems. Um, it's another one of those areas. Okay, also um, warning that especially in the unsupervised situation, but maybe in general, uh, outlier detection <coughs> is a bit of an ambiguous problem in the sense that what is an outlier? All I really said is it's something weird, but that's much less concrete than um, a lot of the other stuff we've been talking about in the course. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. So before we get into that, we've talked a lot about tabular data. So we can just take a look at this made up table from the food allergy example with some questionable stuff highlighted in red. Um, so some questions you may want to ask yourself before you start any sort of data science machine learning process. Um, would any of the values throw a type error in the sort of programming languages sense? Well, if the amount of wheat in cups or servings or something um, is one of the columns, and one of the entries in that column is sick, then that's sort of like a string where you're expecting a float or something like that. Right? So that's sort of a more obvious error that you might have in your data set. Um, but there's all kinds of other strange things that might be happening. 
Did I really eat 900 eggs in a day? No, right? It's not going to throw a type error, but it doesn't look right. Um, or did I have ne negative one servings of, of shellfish? I, again, we don't want to think too carefully about what that would mean, but let's just say <laughs> it probably didn't happen. Um, likewise, you might have duplicated data. So this is something I mentioned before in the course, and it doesn't seem that bad. You might look at this and just say, you know what, it's not big of, that big of a deal. I have this column in there twice, but we'll talk about it later why that can really be a problem. Another thing you might just have is completely useless features. Now that's not on the slide, but you might just have, uh, I don't know, some commit ID from your, you, you made some commit in it, or some other kind of meaningless number or value associated with each row. Um, completely useless features that don't help you in any way can actually be damaging. And it's again back to this overfitting issue that we've been talking about in the course. If you have not infinite data, you may find patterns that are meaningless. And so you may find that if the commit ID has a C in the third position, then, I don't know, the code is very likely to be high quality or something. You, you could discover that, right? And it may be true on whatever data set you have. Um, and so later in the course we'll also talk about feature selection and part of the motivation for feature selection is to throw away these um, not helpful features, but we can also think of it as a, a data cleaning issue. Okay, um, right, so as far-fetched as this may seem, this stuff happens and it's sort of the data preparation stage maybe before we get to what we'll call outlier detection, although the 900 eggs is, could be thought of that as well, too. Okay, um, so how are we going to do this? One way we can do it is using a probabilistic model. So if something was very unlikely to happen according to my beliefs about the world, that could be called an outlier. So for those of you who have taken some statistics, You've probably heard of the Z-score. If not, it's just the number of standard deviations away from the mean that you are in a Gaussian distribution or normal distribution. So if I'm 10 standard deviations away, that's a super unlikely thing to happen. Um, and so the larger the Z-score, the more surprising or low probability something is. Um, and this is just saying we're taking the sample mean and sample variance to compute the z-score. So we could have some threshold, like if the z-score is greater than 4, absolute value of it, then we call it an outlier, and otherwise we don't. May not be a good way of finding outliers, but it's one approach, um, which is this probabilistic approach. So, um, one of several problems with this approach is that even the sample mean and sample variance, um, which you're using to estimate the mean and variance, are themselves sensitive to outliers. So you may have um, a totally crazy entry in your data set, which makes you completely wrong about what the mean actually is. And then all of your scores that you're computing can be wrong or misleading. So there are some ways of dealing with this to be um, computing statistics that are robust to outliers. We talked about quantiles at the beginning of the course, things like that. Um, another problem with the z-score is this probabilistic thing should work better if our model is actually somewhat true. But if, for example, our data are not unimodal, meaning if I have multiple humps instead of just one hump, like in the, in the situation in the picture, then we can get something totally confusing. I could have two modes that are super far away from each other um, and all kinds of situations like that, and maybe I'll get misleading results out of my Z-score. 
Yeah, yeah. So would you call this bimodal? I, yeah, this would be bimodal. Okay. Um, so let me make things more complicated, or make the, the, the task even murkier. So would you say this red point is an outlier? Anyone? Sure. Think some nods? Yeah, sure, why not? Um, but what about now? What if our data set also includes these blue points? Would you consider the red point to be an outlier? That is a much harder question to answer. Um, it kind of is and it kind of isn't, right? It depends how we define outlier. Is it outside the range of the rest of our data? No, the x coordinate is not outside the range and the y coordinate is not outside the range. But on the other hand, it's not close to anything. So maybe we would consider it an outlier. Um, in the case of the z-score, like we were just talking about, the red point is actually sort of the least outlier -y point in the sense that it's right there at the mean of the distribution. But maybe we do think of it as an outlier. So we can make this distinction between global versus local outliers, global meaning it's outside the range of the whole data set and local meaning it's within the range but it's not close to anything. Um, and this is just sort of adding to the pain of, of outlier detection and as I was saying at the beginning it's just not that easy to even say what an outlier is. Maybe we need types of outliers, different methods for each, etc. Okay. Um, if I said an outlier is something that's not close to anything, then I add more of these red points. Well, now they are close to each other, but are they still outliers? How many points do I need to add there until I'm not going to call it an outlier anymore and it's an actual signal? Um, these are complicated questions that may be domain specific or application specific in their answers. You can always come up with the next more provocative and annoying example to refute what you had just decided. Okay, um, so graphical, in other words, use a human with yourself to look at the data and does it look like an outlier? So I went back to this Titanic data set that we looked at at the beginning and I made a box plot of the fare that people paid. Um, and these box plots show you outliers. So you can just look and see there's one person who maybe had a very high fare on the Titanic for whatever reason. So um, that's OK, but we can only really look at one variable at a time, in this case, the fare. And so that's quite limiting. Maybe we have thousands or 10,000 features. Uh, you can also make a scatter plot. So a scatter plot allows you to look at two variables. I picked the two <coughs> numerical variables there were in that data set. Again, you can see this outlier. Um, scatter plots would also allow you to see local outliers in that maybe your scatter plot was sort of curved with one point far away from the curve. So the outlier is still within the range in either case, but when you look at two dimensions at a time, you might see it, but still, this is only two dimensions out of possibly very many. Uh, we talked about scatter plot arrays at the very beginning, but again, there's only so much you can really look at um, as a person looking at a two dimensional screen, basically. Okay. Um, so we talked about clustering. You can use clustering to do outlier detection. You could run k-means and look for points that are very far away from their means, as we see here in this example. Uh, or you could find just very tiny clusters if you're allowing outlier groups. If I have a tiny cluster with only three points in it, maybe I'll say those are outliers. Um, with DB scan, in a way, you don't even have to do anything because it already has this property that some points aren't 
assigned to clusters, and maybe you don't say those are all outliers, maybe you say they're candidates, maybe there's 20 of them and you want to investigate them. It again depends on the specific situation. Okay, so just to make concrete these words, you could think of one of these as a global outlier, it's just way out of range. Local outlier, it's in the midst of a bunch of other stuff but not near anything, an outlier group is just a bunch of them together. Ian. So for the two points that aren't labeled, like they're inside one of the ranges but not in the other, would that be global or local? The two points that aren't labeled. So the two red circles. Um, oh, I see. Uh, the red circles that aren't labeled. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose you might say the one on the bottom right is a global outlier because <coughs> the other one is local, but I, I don't get too caught up in this stuff yet. It's, I won't ask you to tell me if an outlier is global or local, if that's what you're thinking. Yeah, okay. Um, and so we can also use hierarchical clustering to merge a bunch of clusters one after the other, and if one point or group of points is taking a very long time to be merged, um, that means it's not near anything because we kept merging nearby points. <coughs> um, and so that would be another way of finding outliers. Any questions? Um, yes, Oliver. Okay. Um, so for hierarchical clustering, we create this tree of clusters. So, um, how do we end up choosing our clusters that we want? Do we sort of choose, for example, the leaves of the tree, or maybe along a depth? So Oliver's question is for hierarchical clustering, how do we end up choosing the final cluster? So partly that depends on what you're after. If it may be that the tree is the thing you want, and then you don't have to make this decision. But if you end up just wanting a regular clustering, then you're right. You sort of have to pick a depth and cut off and decide um, what is a cluster and what is it. So um, I don't have first-hand experience doing this, but I could imagine you, you might want to do something similar to picking the way we pick k and k means, as you can see perhaps how some sort of score changes as you look at the different depth and maybe there's some natural transition point or something like that. Marian? Uh, in model-based clustering, how would you make sure that the data is normally distributed? In what type of clustering? Model-based. In model-based clustering, okay, so we didn't talk about model-based clustering. Uh, it was not that. You talked about the normal distribution. Oh, okay, okay. So, so there's model-based clustering, um, which we aren't covering in the course, which is you take some distribution that's a mixture of, say, Gaussians, and you try to fit it to the data. Um, in terms of the model-based outlier detection, which is what you're referring to, I think, um, you asked how do you make sure the distribution is Gaussian, and that was exactly the problem I was presenting. You, you don't know, right? So, and, and the more wrong you are, the more wrong your conclusions might be if you try to draw conclusions based on that wrong assumption. And so, for example, you might get Z scores that don't correspond to what you would consider an outlier. In general, when you're doing probabilistic modeling, everything always is sort of okay as long as your model is sort of right. But if your model's completely wrong, <coughs> And your results may be poor. Okay, um, so today we did the tail end of talking about density based clustering. Um, we then talked about hierarchical clustering, and I just want to emphasize that this is, you're not. I presented some problems with DB scan and that hierarchical clustering solved the problem. So we solved the problems by changing what the output looks like. We say if we can deal with looking at a tree, um, we may be able to actually understand our data better. And if we don't do that, 
if we, as Oliver was saying, if we just cut it off at some density or some radius, then we might miss interesting insights like I have these, as I was saying before, two groups of customers, or I have this group of customers, but maybe there are these two subgroups that I would like to know about when I'm marketing my pointless social media app or whatever it is to them. Um, so we talked about agglomerative clustering as a standard way of doing hierarchical clustering. So there's different ways you could do this. This is you're starting with the leaves and you're merging them and merging them. Um, there are methods that are the other way around. So you start with one big cluster and you cut them and you keep cutting clusters off. Um, those, those types of methods exist as well. And um, we talked about outlier detection, which is this task of finding something unusual or different. But it's hard to define what an outlier is. Um, and there's many things that could go wrong, including throwing away something that was actually useful and a real effect like we had with the ozone layer. Um, example at the beginning. So there's a whole bunch of ways of approaching outlier detection. There are situations where you want to remove outliers, situations where you want to find outliers, unsupervised approaches, supervised approaches. Um, and I'll just say one other thing that seems sort of relevant here, which is that um, for those interested in image processing and computer vision, that sort of stuff, there's a, a problem called image segmentation. We, we have two minutes left, which doesn't happen very often, so I'll just say this. Uh, I, it was just something I used to work on, and it's, it's an interesting problem of if I have a particular image, what are the different pieces in the image? So there's a person, and some floor, and some wall. Um, and if you could do this, you might be able to do a better job of understanding images, or storing them, or classifying them, or all these different kinds of things. Um, and it's actually related to clustering in the sense that you're actually trying to find groups of pixels that are the same object. And then once you do that, you say you found the person, you could also do interesting visual effects, take the person out of the picture, etc. Um, and actually quite similar sort of reasoning applies and you do do things like you take the image and you try to slice it along. Um, the best sort of slice to find in some way, and you just keep doing that, and so on and so forth. So, for those of you who are into computer vision, I just thought I'd mention that connection. Uh, and now we're actually done. So, see you on Wednesday.